And just to talk about the rationale for HPV vaccination in people living with HIV. So we know that HPV and HIV are a double burden. Both viruses look extremely beautiful, but they are also extremely dangerous. Women living with HIV are at least four to five times greater at risk of developing cervical cancer, which is the second most common cancer in women living in low and middle income countries. And of course, when people get cervical cancer and they are not tested immediately, they are not treated quickly, they die. And these deaths are unnecessary because cervical cancer is preventable. The burden that HIV places on women, particularly adolescent girls and young women from low and middle income countries, is compounded by the global burden of HPV uh, cancers. I, I usually use this quotation from um, Her Excellency Gertrude Motharika, the First Lady of Malawi, who said that today women are surviving the HIV diagnosis only to, to succumb to unavoidable cancer. And so there is need for concerted effort to respond to the double burden of HIV and cervical cancer. It is unwarranted now more than ever. We need to increase the coverage of cervical cancer screening, especially for women living with HIV, but also to start treatment early and make the vaccine accessible to all girls. So each of us needs to do our part so that humanity will thrive. I told you we were going to repeat this many times, the 90, 70, 90. So vaccination should be to at least 90% of the girls by the age of 15 and screening for all women using high performance tests by the age of 35. And I'd like to ask by a show of hands, how many of us women in this room have been screened for HPV in the last three years? Okay, maybe I should have said how many of us are women, all of us. <laughs> And then how many of us have screened for HPV? So clearly not everyone has screened. And if you are above the age of 35 and you have not been screened, this is a call to you to go and screen when you get back after this conference. The 90% of women who have precancerous re uh, lesions should be treated and those with um, invasive cancer should be managed. So these are the targets. The targets, as we've said, are 90, 70, and 90. But as we heard, the HIV targets are 90% of the population tested, 95% treated, and 95 virally suppressed. So gentlemen, you're not um, out of the woods on this. Even men suffer from HPV, and they can get cancer and they get penile cancer, which you all know the treatment. It's amputation. But this is uh, just to emphasize that HPV is a significant global health burden. One person every minute is diagnosed with an HPV-related cancer, including cervical cancer, vulvo and vaginal cancer, cervical dysplasia, and then the oropharyngeal cancers and anal cancers. If you look at this map, it clearly shows you that there is a clear reflection or a mirror image of the HIV and HPV prevalence. And we can see that in Africa, where we have the highest burden of HIV, we also have the highest burden of cervical cancer. So there's a close interaction if you have HPV acquisition risk and persistence of infection, you're likely to cause a disease progression of the intraepithelial neoplasia, but also HPV can in turn switch on the susceptibility to HIV. So women living with HIV are six times more likely to develop uh, cervical cancer compared to women who are HIV negative. 
Um, we know that there are now vaccines, there are the bivalent vaccines and also the quadrivalent vaccines, but also the nanovalent vaccines. And because we know that the nanovalent vaccines protect 90.3% of the cancer-causing uh, HPV, we'd like to call upon the manufacturers, particularly MSD, to ensure that we have access to the nanovalent vaccine. So I'll quickly take you through some slides on safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy of HPV vaccination for people living with HIV and AIDS. And this was a systemic uh, review by Zan and others, which showed that when compared with placebo groups, the risk of adverse events did not increase when people had HIV. And also that the antibody seroconversion rates for HPV 6 to 11, 16 and 18 types were 94, 98 and 90% respectively. So there's actually good response. And the antibody ge uh, geometric mean titers were lower for people living with HIV. In another study done by Levin and others, done in children who are given a four-valent vaccine, they clearly showed safety and good immunogenicity when these children were vaccinated. And closer to home, Dr. Mary Mugo and her team have shown that antibody um, response among people living with HIV is prolonged and that there is sustained HPV seropositivity and the geometric um, titers are prolonged, giving us reassurance that there's a possible long-term efficacy of vaccination when people living with HIV are vaccinated. This is a recent study by one of our master's students at Makere, where she was looking at the prevalence and factors associated with HPV vaccination among adolescents attending a large HIV clinic in Kampala, Uganda. For us, what shocked all of us was the fact that only 1.5% of this population had completed their HPV vaccination. And these are HIV-infected uh, adolescents and young women. There were many reasons why um, they didn't complete. There was inadequate knowledge from the healthcare providers, but also from the patients. There was fear of the side effects of the vaccine. And then the parents don't want to approve their children because they consent. And sometimes there are stockouts. So we need to deal with stockouts, especially as we want to scale up. So just to quickly summarize what I have said, we know that there are high rates of seroconversion when HIV-infected individuals are given the HPV vaccine and children and adolescents living with HIV should be vaccinated because when they have a low viral load and a high CD4 count prior to sexual debut, they have a better immune response. And we know that HPV vaccines are generally well tolerated among HIV-infected individuals. So these are WHO recommendations that people living with HIV should be vaccinated irrespective of their age, and they should be given at least two doses. And HPV DNA detection should be um, used to screen for HPV. And then the treatment should be possible as well. Um, these are just a summary of uh, other guidelines from Europe and the US, where um, in the European guidelines, they vaccinate a give a three dose schedule to people between nine and 26 years. In the US, they vaccinate until 40 years. But for Africa, all we are requesting is HPV vaccination and testing, especially for HIV positive women, should be a priority, especially in the developing countries. And this is just what I already said, that we have to build synergies. 
We know that there is a big association between HPV and HIV, and I'd like to thank the Interest Conference at this time for ensuring that the conversation on HPV and HIV is continued. There are synergies between HIV response and efforts to prevent, diagnosis and treatment of cancer, and so the call is upon all of us to reduce the HIV and HPV double burden. Thank you.